Hello, I'm Louise Hughes, the Product Manager for Life Science at Oxford Instruments Nano Analysis, and I would like to thank you for watching my tech talk on multicolour biological electron microscopy with EDS. Electron microscopy has been used for decades in biological research, primarily because of its ability to provide high resolution images of specimens. However, this does come with some restraints, and these revolve around the sample preparation, often involving some form of fixation, and then, if not using cryo-electron microscopy, dehydration of the sample. Contrast is often added in the form of heavy metal stains, and for TEM, the samples are usually embedded in resin and sectioned. For SEM, they would be dried and coated. The sample you can see on the screen is the plain face of a resin embedded hydroxyapatite bone implant in the process of degradation and it's been imaged using an SEM. It was hoped that by using heavy metal staining on the sample there would be enough of a contrast difference to see cellular material but apart from one distinct cell in the centre it is actually quite challenging to differentiate between the implant and the tissue. And this is because of the grayscale nature of imaging samples with SEM and TEM. Instead, we can use a technique that has been gaining a lot of interest over the past few years, and that is multicolour electron microscopy, combining the electron images with additional signals generated as a result of exposing a biological sample to an electron beam. The image shown here is now a much more colourful image and you can clearly see some distinct features including the green cellular material that is scattered throughout the lacunae within the implant. And this indicates how multicolour electron microscopy can be a really powerful imaging tool. In the example shown here, we've used a technique called Energy Dispersive X-ray Spectrometry, also known as EDS or EDX. EDS detects and measures the energy of X-rays emitted from the sample, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this in a minute. The energy of the X-ray indicates the element it originates from, thus providing information about the composition of the sample, and this also results in striking images such as this one, which massively aid interpretation of the images produced. These diagrams help to explain a little bit about what's going on when the electron beam interacts with a sample. On the left, you can see the beam interacting with a specimen and a range of different signals being emitted from different depths within the sample. These include secondary electrons and backscattered electrons that are commonly used for imaging. It also includes characteristic X-rays, and these are the ones we detect using EDS, and continuum or background X-rays, as well as a variety of other fluorescent signals. On the right hand side, you can see a schematic of an atom and some of the interactions that occur. When the main beam electrons interact with atoms within the sample, several things can happen. The electrons can be transmitted, and these are the ones detected in TEM, or they can be scattered, and the scattered electrons create contrast. The diagram also indicates where we have elastic and inelastic scattering of electrons. Elastically scattered electrons occur when main beam electrons are slowed down and lose energy as a result of passing close to the atomic nucleus. And this released energy is in the form of background or continuum X-rays. Main beam electrons can also transfer energy to an electron within one of the shells surrounding the atomic nucleus. And this results in the production and emission of a secondary electron. The loss of this electron from one of the inner shells results in the ionisation of the atom and creates an unstable state. And this stability is regained when an electron from an outer shell fills that inner shell vacancy. And it does this by releasing the energy in the form of an X-ray photon. These X-ray photons are known as characteristic X-rays because measuring the energy of the X-ray indicates 
the type of atom that it originated from. So it allows us to identify the elements within a sample. And this is what we try to do with EDS. An example image of an EDS detector is shown here on the left. And you can see the snout of the detector lying alongside the pole piece of a scanning electron microscope. We also have TEM detectors which aren't shown here. This is where we collect the x-rays emitted from the sample and these are detected using a silicon drift detector which converts them into an electronic signal. This is then sent to a processor which measures the electronic signal and calculates the energy of the x-rays. Our Aztec software displays the spectrum of x-rays and automatically identifies and deconvolutes the data and removes background. This is a fast process and is performed as the electron beam is scanning across a sample, storing a spectrum for each position of the electron beam. And this can then be converted into a map of the elements within the sample, as shown in the image on the right. Here is a closer look at a spectrum generated from the sample shown in the electron image at the top left of the slide, featuring macrophages grown on a plastic cover slip. And the things I want you to pay attention to here is that along the bottom we have our X-ray energy and where we have our peaks that's where we've accumulated many X-ray counts at that energy. So the peaks indicate X-ray intensity and this allows us to generate quantitative data about how much of each element is within our sample. So we can convert this information into maps and have displays representing the distribution of elements across the sample. And here's an example where we've got several different maps. And this is a low mag image of the example I showed you at the start of this presentation. You can see in the maps you get relative different intensities of signal across the area being scanned. These are individual maps, so each map shows the distribution of an individual element. And these images can be combined with the electron data to produce a multi-layered map, as you can see here. And each of these images contains quantitative values for each element at each pixel position. So if you want to revisit your data at any point and obtain quantitative values, it is possible to do that within our software. EDS can thus provide you with a range of information about your specimen. It can identify what elements are present within your sample, can measure how much of each element is present and display them in a proportional basis and also indicate where each element is located within your sample by producing EDS maps. What does this mean for biological research? Well, I'm going to spend the next few minutes just giving you a few different examples of how EDS can contribute to our understanding of biological specimens. EDS can be used to map the distribution of and measure endogenous elements. These are elements that are naturally found within biological tissue. And this can be done either to directly measure those elements or, and in the vast majority of cases, to compare changes in elements between samples. For example, if you've added a treatment or looking at different time points within your sample. It could also be used to identify areas where you have an enhancement of any particular one element, for example, calcium. And here we have an example of an unstained plant cell, and this was imaged in a TEM. And you can clearly see in the multi-layer map how we've got a really nice distribution of elements across the cell itself. You can see the nucleus in the middle of the image. And I've got two individual maps, one showing the phosphorus and one showing calcium. And by selecting regions within my maps, I can then produce quantitative values of the weight percentage of elements in those regions. And in the chart, I've just shown you the weight percentage of phosphorus and calcium in these three regions that I've selected. 
In this way, we can measure and compare within the same sample, but also between samples imaged under the same type of conditions. Here is another example, and this is, again, plant cells. These are stained with osmium and zinc, as you can see in the maps. And I wanted to show you this as it's an example of where you can find specific regions of interest. In this instance, a concentration of iron in the chloroplast, which is a relatively rare occurrence, but can quite clearly be identified using EDS in this example. It is also possible to identify and measure exogenous elements, and these can be things that are found in biological tissue but have an origin outside of it. And this can be things like pollutants, heavy metal contamination, nanoparticles, surgical implants, a variety of different types. And here we have an example of macrophages that have been exposed to cobalt nanoparticles. And EDS has been used here to identify the cobalt nanoparticles as being separate from some of the other regions of the tissue that have an equally bright backscattered electron signal and actually compose of sodium and silicon. Here we have a second example and this shows particles from air pollution deposited onto the surface of a leaf and these leaves were collected by Rob Kessler, one of our collaborators. You can see how EDS can easily be used to identify the composition of these pollutant particles on the leaf surface. As mentioned earlier on in the presentation, staining is a very big part of electron microscopy and necessary in order to be able to localise specific areas and visualise the sample. And here we have a couple of examples where we're using EDS to analyse the distribution of a selective stain in the sample. So on the left hand side we have images of Venus's flytrap and this has been stained using zinc iodide osmium and you can see that there's a variability in the ratio between zinc and osmium in different regions across the sample and this can be quite informative as to the contents of different cells and organelles. On the right hand side there's a reference to a publication where they've used EDS to identify different types of immunolabel which can be used to localise proteins within cells and you can see here that the electron contrast image means you just get black dots for the label but if you turn on the EDS you can identify the different components of the labels in this case cadmium dots and gold immunolabels. So EDS can be used not only to look at components naturally within the cells or exogenous components that have been introduced but also used to help you analyse the labels and stains you've applied to the sample. There may be some samples where you've not been able to add additional contrast. For example, samples used for immunolabeling and cryo-EM samples. And in those situations, it can be really difficult to analyse cell ultrastructure. Here we have an example where we have an unstained cell, such as that that would usually be produced for immunolabeling. And you can see the difference between the stained cell and the unstained cell. But as soon as we turn on the EDS, using the element maps, we are actually able to pick up a lot of these thin thylakoid membranes that are indicated by the orange arrows in the chloroplast here. So in this instance, we're able to use EDS to image the ultrastructure of the sample instead of using electron contrast. Here we're actually looking at a cryo sample and we're able to use EDS to identify the line of cells here in this wheat seed which could otherwise be quite difficult to identify. So I hope I've been able to show you a few different examples of how EDS can address biological samples, facilitate identification of composition and also help with imaging your sample and this is where the multicolour electron microscopy really comes into its own. 
Oxford Instruments have a range of different detectors that are optimised in such a way that they make it ideal for looking at life science samples. And you can see them here. The Altim 170 is our largest area detector and I'll show you in a minute why that's quite important. The Altim Extreme is a windowless detector which means it doesn't have a window between the environment of the microscope chamber and the silicon drift detector. So more of the light element x-rays can actually get through to hit the detector and this can be quite important for life science samples. The Ultimax TLE is our TEM equivalent of the Ultim Extreme. But the reason that large area detectors are so important is it increases our speed and it increases the count rate. So if you compare here the images generated between a traditional 10 mm squared detector and the Ultimax large area detectors, you can see in the bottom of the range of images how much area and information from a sample we can obtain in the same amount of time. So we're imaging the sample for less time and collecting a lot more of the x-rays emitted from the sample. And this makes a really big difference for the time it takes to analyse your sample. You can see a cutaway diagram showing a conventional EDS detector design and you can see that it has a window between the crystal and the exterior of the detector and this is in order to protect the crystal um, from the environment. So we've been able to change this design and actually remove that window and this can be important because the window can absorb low energy x-rays emitted from the sample and low energy x-rays are often emitted from light elements of which most biological samples are composed. And here we have a comparison between um, a standard EDS detector like the Ultimax 170 and the Ultim Extreme detector which is our windowless detector. And you can see by redesigning the end of the detector and removing the window we've been able to reduce the distance from which the detector is from the sample. And this is quite important because it also means we can reduce the working distance and improve the resolution of our images doing so. I've already mentioned that removing the window improves the detection of light elements and you can see this quite clearly in this image comparison on the right hand side where we've got the Altim Max 120 and the Altim Extreme. Now this is imaged at 6 kV and you can quite clearly see in the EDS maps how we get a lot stronger signal in particular from the yellow component which is nitrogen and nitrogen is very easily absorbed by the window of standard EDS detectors but with the Ultim Extreme we're able to actually detect and measure the nitrogen in the sample which is particularly important for biological specimens. So to summarise the Ultim Extreme detector has excellent light element detection ideal for low energy x-rays and looking at the endogenous elements in biological samples. And because it can detect low energy x-rays, it also means that it can operate under low kV conditions in an SEM, which improves the image resolution, it can improve sample stability and reduce damage to beam sensitive specimens like most biological samples are. It also has maximised the count rate of x-rays it can receive by having a large area detector, which means you can image samples for less time. And we've optimised electronics in the system so that it's much faster, but also produces a lot less noise, thus optimising the difference between the peaks and the background in the spectrum and facilitating identification. And our Altim TLE detector is the TEM equivalent, which is a windowless detector in a TEM. So I hope from this you're able to take away some understanding of what multicolour electron microscopy using EDS is and how it can benefit your research, whether you're looking at endogenous elements, exogenous elements, stains, labels, or just trying to generate more contrast and identify specific regions within your sample. 
and I finished with a bit of summary about our detectors, but specifically the Ultim Extreme, which is optimised for biological research in an SEM setting. Thank you very much for your attention. Please take a look at our website if you want more information or speak to us on our exhibition booth. Thank you very much.